Fabulous. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Jane and um, uh, Aaron and myself, and we've got a couple of our other members on the line today, Jonas, Catherine and Jerry, and we're all part of a multicultural valuation special interest group at AES. And so today's seminar is, uh, uh, you know, something that we like to do, um, particularly on issues that relate to, um, you know, what is equitable evaluation? How do we do, you know, what does it mean in practice? Um, and exploring the variety of multicultural frameworks and approaches. But I've sort of gone about this the wrong way and I should, I should um, just pause to acknowledge country. And in the spirit of reconciliation, um, multicultural valuation, SIG acknowledges traditional custodians of the um, country and First Nations people throughout Victoria, Australia and New Zealand, their connections to land, sea and community. We value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's history, cultures and knowledge and pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nation peoples. Um, so yes, and today we've got Bob, who's uh, a systems thinker and evaluator, and he has been in the systems, using systems concepts and thinkings in his work for over 30 years. And his specialty is complex and difficult projects and programs with a focus on approaches that are robust and rigorous, and but at the same time produce information and analyses that are good enough for the organisations that need to use that information. And I think rather than me, oh, so, and so the other thing I just wanted to say is that um, Bob's pre-recorded his um, uh, presentation today and we're going to pause about 15 minutes in and open up the room for um, about 10 minutes of Q&A and discussion and then we'll resume for the final 15 minutes followed by the remainder of the session uh, as an open um, Q&A uh, discussion again. And um, both Bob and Aaron will be, and myself will be monitoring the chat. So as the presentation kicks in, if you have any questions um, or thoughts, uh, um, please pop them there. And I think, Bob, we shall get going. Okay. Uh, let me just check everything before we start up. And um, just to point out that uh, I'm overlooking the, uh, the harbour of uh, the Whanganui Atara in uh, Wellington. Um, but I'm speaking from uh, the rohe of uh, Te Apiawa, one of the iwi of, uh, of the local area. So. Welcome everybody. Thanks very much for giving me this opportunity to, to think a bit more about the relationship between ideas from the systems field and ideas from the evaluation field. Um, and in particular, uh, around the area of um, equity. As I said, this is, um, I've got a particular throat problem at the moment, uh, 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 which means that if I talk for much more than about two minutes, I descend into a fit of coughs which is one reason for the pre-record. But the other pre-record is that, uh, the other reason I've discovered is that actually I seem to be far more coherent when I actually have to sit down and um, listen to what I've said before than just riffing uh, in a particular, uh, on a particular topic. So um, the first section of this is about 15 minutes long. Fingers crossed, we have tested it, uh, that everything will work. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a chat and then we'll go on for another 15 minutes. So, um, so let's go. Uh, I'll probably do a couple of things. And I'm sure someone will tell me if it's not working. This presentation and discussion will explore the ways in which the adoption of systemic practice and evaluation can help address issues of equity. Now I'm going to present a particular framework of understanding what constitutes a systemic framework. And then I'm going to explore three practical ways of using that framework. 
Now, I don't expect you to get absolutely everything I present to you in the next half hour. There's an awful lot of stuff in this presentation that may be new to you. But however, I do anticipate that you'll be able to take quite a few things away and begin to use them in your evaluations, especially those with a particular equity bias and orientation. There will inevitably be time for discussion as well. Discussions about equity within evaluation tend to fall into two categories. The first category concerns how evaluation looks at the intervention and explores processes and outcomes through an equity in that intervention through an equity lens using uh, equity criteria. The second, which is often described as culturally responsive evaluation, concerns how the evaluation itself promotes equitable outcomes directly as a consequence of the evaluation. Now in this particular talk I will focus largely on the second. Why is that? Well partly the reason is practical. Evaluation has been working on the issue of exploring how to assess interventions through an equity lens for quite some time. And I think the ideas from the systems field, while they can be valuable and we can talk about them at some other stage, I don't think it's a game changer. I believe the major impact will be in the way in which evaluation can use systemic ideas in the way that it is practiced as a craft. In other words, evaluation by becoming more systemic will actually contribute to equitable outcomes of the evaluations. Why am I interested in that? Well. I think it's an issue of professional ethics. How can we stand in judgment of interventions around equity when we are not ourselves focusing on equitable outcomes of our own practice? As a craft, we've talked a lot, a lot about use, utilization and usefulness for many years. But really, only recently have we been seriously considering the question, useful to whom? So let's start on this journey of how we can encourage evaluation to become more systemic by stepping back and actually looking at this thing called the systems field. And here's a diagram produced by Ray Eisen, one of the leading figures in the evaluation field, of how he considers you can describe visually what comprises the systems field. Now I invite you first to look at the left hand side of the column and what you'll see there is a very substantial list of human endeavor, human philosophies, human ideas and practices that have actually influenced the development of the systems field over the last century or so towards developing the kinds of methods and methodologies that you will see listed on the right hand side of the diagram, some of which you may be familiar with. Unfortunately, some of those things that you may have heard about have got slightly changed in the telling and have often generated some inaccurate understandings of what a systemic approach actually is and what the systems field represents. What I've got here are three myths, very common myths, about what the systems field and a systemic approach uh, is all about. The first one is that systems are universally self-evident and real. In fact, systems are human constructs. You and I could look at exactly the same situation and see completely different systems there. The second one is really is that the myth is about the big stuff. You know, how many times have you heard people talk about at the systems level? This is a terribly limiting idea of what the systems field is all about. System, systemic practice and the systems are scale free essentially. Um, a cell as well as the universe can be considered a system. And the third myth, myth is probably the most dangerous of them all. And that myth is about the systemic approach and systems approaches and systems thinking about including everything. Now that's actually practically and intellectually impossible. So what the systems field is about actually and what systemic practice is about is being about very smart about what you leave out not trying to include absolutely everything including the kitchen sink, which will only just confuse you. 
Now, a couple of slides ago, I showed you this enormous range of systems and systemic approaches. Very diverse, with lots of different ways of addressing various systemic issues. But what do they actually have in common? Well, what makes them a field, in a sense? Well, let's start at what comprises a system around which there is some general agreement. Now, here is a relatively common definition of a system. A system is a collection of entities that are seen by someone as interacting together in order to achieve something. And here's a visual way of representing this. What I've done is organize the definition of a system around three core components, interrelationships, perspectives, and boundaries. Now, it should be fairly self-evident that that particular shuffling around in terms of interrelationships, a collection of entities interacting together, that are seen by someone, a perspective, different perspectives will look at the same things in slightly different ways. But why are boundaries about achieving something? Well, that goes back to the third myth. We cannot look at every single collection of entities interacting together. We cannot take every single perspective on those entities either, or those interactions either. In order to do anything, in order to respond in any way, in order to achieve something, we're going to have to start deciding which of these interrelationships and which of these perspectives we are actually going to take notice of, and which ones, therefore, we are going to have to leave out. Notice also that the three elements interrelate, change our perspectives, and we construct different boundaries change the collection of entities that interact together and that we'll actually generate different perspectives and both of those demand quite different decisions over where to set boundaries however we don't just want to observe systems that doesn't really lead us very far but we want to practice systemic thinking so, in order to do that, we need to add some verbs, some action words. And here are important action words related to systems thinking as practiced. Firstly, we have to understand interrelationships. We have to address the question, what is the reality that we're actually dealing with? In terms of perspectives, it's about engaging with multiple perspectives and ask things like, how do people interpret that reality? And then finally, in terms of the selection of boundaries, which are often ethical and difficult and political, we should also reflect on those boundaries so that we address what is politically and socially and culturally feasible and desirable to do. The, boundary, the remainder of this talk is now going to explore each of these three aspects and how they can assist our evaluations generate equitable outcomes. Now, given that these aspects interrelate, it doesn't really matter where we start as long as we just kind of keep going around the circle. And since this presentation is primarily about equity, um, and equity can be considered really as a perspective, let's start there. Engaging with perspectives is all about the different ways a situation or intervention, like evaluation, can be understood. So take this illustration. There are two ways in which it actually can be understood, depending on your perspective. Some of you will see uh, an old woman. Some of you will see a younger woman. Uh, the point that I want to make from an evaluation point of view is the data is exactly the same, but we see different things. 
Now I want to make an important clarification here. Different perspectives, taking different perspectives, engaging with different perspectives is not about handling different opinions about the same perspective or the same understanding, but genuinely different lenses through which a situation or an evaluation can be viewed. Now I call this particular viewpoint a framing. Which of course begs the question about what exactly I mean by a framing. A framing is through the lens through which someone views the situation. It addresses the particular issue of how different people would complete the sentence, a system that is something to do with, a system that is something to do with health, a system that is something to do with equity, a system that is something to do with the improvement of a particular transport system. Let me give you an example of a needle exchange program. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of needle exchange programs. They were very common in the 80s and the 90s. Basically, the idea is that uh, intravenous drug users, um, rather than sharing a needle, can actually take a needle to a particular site and exchange a dirty needle for a clean needle. Now, there are three ways in which at least three ways in which a needle exchange program can be viewed, can be framed. The first one is for HIV or any, in, indeed any blood uh, transmitted uh, infection. It's the reduction of HIV. The second one is that actually many of these places turned out to be very safe places for scoring. People were actually not hassled for actually taking drugs. Deals were done with the, with the police and so on in practice. And the third one was they're not always terribly popular in the local area. Uh, local people often see them affecting their rental values, their property values, or at least the sort of reputation of, of, of their local area. Now, all these three are different framings. And if you think in evaluation terms, if you were evaluating a particular needle and exchange program, depending on your framing, you would come up with quite different ideas about whether the program was worthwhile or not. Now, returning to evaluation, very often and very commonly, evaluations are framed as effectively something to do with accountability or something to do with program improvement or something to do with learning. However, in the context that we're exploring, the implications of taking an equity framing, in this case, our evaluation is a system that is something to do with equitable outcomes. Now, how on earth do we actually unpick this and use the idea of framings? Well, one of the ways that I do this is through the concept of stakeholder. Now, let me clear what I mean by a stakeholder. St stakeholder is someone or something, it can be a thing, affected by or affects someone or someone, something that is of interest to us. So this is one way of the, that I manage this issue of framings and begin to kind of expand my understanding of the consequences of taking and say in this case an equity framing, something to do with equitable outcomes. Firstly, the system has stakeholders and they play a role. In this case, I've just got five example roles of an evaluation um, on something or other within a school setting. The reason why there are multiple roles, it's why we're talking about roles rather than stakeholders, is just to highlight the issue that actually people can take on multiple roles within a particular system. So the principal in many smaller schools would actually also be the maths teacher. Um, in many organizations in, with internal evaluators, they often may play a, 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 a practical role in whatever it is. 
Um, and of course, the maths teacher in this particular case uh, could well be um, uh, a caregiver, another role that's not there, of uh, some of the students. So that's the stakeholder role. So the next thing I look at is, well, what actually are the actions that are associated with that particular stakeholder role in the system? And remember, this is an evaluation system. This isn't necessarily the purely the intervention that, that we're talking about. And I've got some uh, examples there that, that, that you can kind of look through as I work through. The third column essentially just reminds us of what the framing is because of course in many evaluations we often deal with different framings and multiple framings and um, and multiple matrices like these but for this particular example we're just focusing on equity and then the final column which is perhaps the most important one of these is to try and understand what the motivation and interest these particular roles have within the system, within the system that we are talking about, which is the evaluation system. So there will be reporting requirements, there will be issues to do with school ranking, there would be commitments to equity in terms of the principal. The math teacher's primarily motivations may be in terms of the, the overall intervention, uh, keeping up grades, but in terms of the evaluation uh, system outcomes, uh, there may well be a sense of fairness. Um, the evaluator themselves obviously have a commit. They may well be motivated by a commitment to the use evaluation of, of, of to the evaluation outcomes, the use of the evaluation and its usefulness, and also motivated by particular aspects of evaluation standards. Um, the student themselves, in the end, maybe just want to be a better math student. Um, the evaluation commissioner has lots of fascinating potential motivations, but here we're just saying that, well, they have a commitment to equity, um, but they're also interested in their own professional capacity on the performance of students. Well, that's quite a lot to take in uh, on a first go the issue of what actually is the systems field and various ways of understanding what systemic approaches are and then exploring in some detail what engaging in multiple perspectives actually means in practice. So I'm going to sort of pause there for a while to allow us to have some discussions before I briefly talk about uh, the area of understanding interrelationships and then spend a lot more time on exploring issues to do with the setting of boundaries and reflecting on them in order to decide what actually is feasible and desirable to do in our evaluations in order to create equitable outcomes. So, onwards to interrelationship. Right. So, um, I'll just finish my uh, response to screen sharing here and bring everyone back to some sense of collective understanding. And um, let's just have a bit of a chat for a while. Yep, uh, please feel free to chime in if you've been thinking about anything or you have a question, or even if you want to challenge some of um, Bob's thinking. Jonas is asking which angle is more important and then Michelle is suggesting with framing in systems thinking and sort of thinking about equitable outcomes, is there such a thing as one of those aspects being more important than the other? Yeah, good questions. Uh Jonas, can you just um, explain a bit what you mean, which angle? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my understanding is that when I'm saying angles, the perspective, the boundaries, and the, the interrelationship. So is it is it the boundaries or is it the perspective that really matter? Or are oh. they all equal? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you ask me, um, I get particularly excited about boundaries. Um, um, but we can talk about that at the end of the boundary discussion we're about to have. However, I must admit that when I first started playing around with these ideas and, and, um, and developing them, or when a collection of uh, evaluators who began to, and systems people who were beginning to develop this kind of triangle idea, I really am this isn't the only way of understanding the systemic approach. Um, I was really interested in perspectives. Um, so, you know, I think to a large extent, it depends where your own particular stance is um, within, within your evaluative activity or with, uh, within your, within your life in general. The official line would be they are all equally important, but obviously some of, to, you know, in, in any endeavor, some um, we feel are more important than others. But mm. remind me to address that question after we've done the boundaries, because I will then explain why I think within an evaluation context um, that it's, it's kind of boundaries first, perspective second, and then relationships third. But I've had... Mm. Uh, uh, Natalie's got a... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, done. Yep, uh, um, Nat Natalie's uh, got a question, Natalie? Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, I guess for me, it's that sense of, because um, I work with Aboriginal communities and being a funding body and also being Aboriginal myself is as we are designing a program, it, I think there is the importance to actually create an evaluation plan, but bringing all different types of people to that evaluation plan. Because sometimes when we say, oh, we want to make sure that it meets people's cultural needs or it's got self-determination and empowerment, we all come with different ideas around what these actual words actually mean. And so what we do is we actually clearly articulate what all the different types of words are, as opposed to assuming what they are, so that when um, we put the program together, fund the program, evaluate the program, we're all on the same perspective from workers to managers to funding bodies on what all these words mean and um, not assume like what we think success for a child is compared to what the community or the people think success for that child is as well. So I think, I think we really got to think about our words because that we all come with our idea of what those words mean. I'm a bit crazy, but that's my, my thinking. No, there's a very important um, quote that I use in a lot of my books, which is that words don't have meanings, they have uses. Um, it is a myth that we can all share the same perspective. We don't. Your perspective, even though we may talk about what a word means, we still have different perspectives on that. And I think one of the areas within the systems field that made me realize that is to be really cautious about an assumptions that we make around shared perspectives. It yeah. is almost impossible for us to share the same meaning of even the same perspective. And I Having said that, I'm not yeah. arguing against having those discussions, right? Um, but I think you always have to keep this in, in the back of your mind. And there is actually a particular system of method I don't talk about um, um, uh, in this particular um, presentation that actually is very sensitive to try and unpick what those things actually mean. Sorry, I spoke over you. Um, no, no, just the sense to also have, you know, the potential workers or end users as part of this program or whatever you're trying to evaluate so that people understand why it's important to collect this so that we can evidence up that their program works best for their community. Yeah, but thank you anyway. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, 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 the big challenge, i just add to that, the big challenge um, that we always have, and this is what we will get onto in the next presentation, is you can never get everybody in the room. But we'll talk about a bit that later. You will have to, in the end, make decisions about who's in and who's out. And that's and, tough. And maybe sort of uh, uh, Melinda's raised something, I think, that sort of speaks to her everything that we've been discussing and that's about power and so power relationships and how they inform the articulations of boundaries so maybe as we watch the next 15 minutes be thinking about 
um, power, and then we'll loop back to that maybe uh, for the final Q and A part of today's session. Please do, because um, especially when you get into issues of deciding boundaries, power and agency become absolutely to the forefront. And uh, again, I talk a little bit about uh, a particular systems approach that attempts at least to expose these kinds of things, but you know, that's part two. Any more yeah. on part one? I don't think so, Bob. So we'll kick on with part two. Righto, okay. So thanks for those questions. They were really uh, to the point, uh, much appreciated. So let's share the screen. Let's do that one. And let's start from this particular slide. Uh, is there a technical problem, Bob? We're not getting the. You're on mute as well. <laughs> we can't hear. You got a copy of the PowerPoint? Uh, here we go. Oh, yep, yeah, that's it. So, onwards to interrelationships and uh, boundaries. Now, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on interrelationships. It's an area where evaluation has actually put in quite a lot of work in terms of understanding interrelationships within a particular setting. Having said that, the systems field does actually have some unique uh, approaches to exploring interrelationships, substantially through diagrams. And I recently published a book that explores six of those particular approaches. And if you're interested in that, then I would encourage you just downloading that, that book afterwards. These particular approaches would include things like rich picturing, uh, influence diagrams and causal diagrams and again I encourage you to take a look at the enormous amount of information on the net should you actually want to look at that in more detail. And here is a way of expressing uh, the learnings from your understanding interrelationships in terms of stakeholder roles. So I've just put a few uh, examples of in a sense, what that role is influenced by, not necessarily caused by, but, but what that role is influenced by, and in terms of outputs, what that role itself may influence. So it's a sort of a, a role-based description of the various yeah, interrelationships uh, that are within the evaluation system that is something to do with equitable outcomes. So now we have explored the somewhat large expanse of what could be considered relevant to achieve an equitable outcome. We've looked at different ways of managing and identifying engaging perspectives and the range of those, and also hinted at the very wide range of interrelationships that any particular situation will display. It's a big palette, and we have to start making decisions 
about what is ethically desirable and practically feasible in order to create, in our case, equitable outcomes of our evaluation. And in order to do that, we're going to have to make some boundary decisions. Now every evaluation is, for, is the product of hundreds of boundary decisions. There are boundaries of space, of time, of purpose, of cost, of knowledge, of values, of perspectives, you name it. And the evaluation boundaries we choose will hugely affect its feasibility and its ability to deliver equitable outcomes. To do this, I use a framework taken from a part of the systems field known as critical systems. Now, critical systems considers that of all the many hundreds, if not thousands, of boundary decisions that are made in any particular intervention, four are particularly important, especially in uh, tasks like the one that we're talking about, which has some specific and potentially contentious goals like equity. Now, the first boundary decision that is going to be made will be about who are and who are not going to be the primary beneficiaries of an equity-framed evaluation. And those that lie outside of that boundary, in the language of critical systems, are termed marginalised, since they lie at the margins of our focus. The second area of boundary choice and boundary decision is the fact that now we have to allocate the resources necessary to bring about these benefits. Now, resources are not infinite. We have limited time and money and other things. And certainly we cannot include every perspective or every possible interrelationship um, in the particular area. We just do not have the resources and the intellectual capacity to do that. Somebody, some body, sometimes, somewhere has to have the ability to say, this is what you have to achieve, this is the resources that you have available, and these are the rules for using those resources. Someone has to have the ability to control whether or not the resources are used in a way that the beneficiaries do actually benefit, and the resources themselves are not hijacked to some other purpose. Someone else then is given the, the granted, indeed, the autonomy to decide whatever needs to be done within those boundaries. In other words, a boundary decision has to be made between control, the ability to decide the resources, and the autonomy, the ability to manage those resources. Exactly where that boundary lies in an evaluation and whether it's in the right place to deliver an equitable evaluation is a critical boundary decision and needs to be made visible and then reflected on in exactly the same way that the beneficiaries and those who are marginalized also need to be identified, made visible, and the choice reflected on. The third is about knowledge. Now, as we know, knowledge itself, the use of knowledge and what is included and what is excluded is these days a very considerable dis a discussion within the evaluation field, especially in relation to indigenous knowledge. So it's important to understand what kind of knowledge is critical in our decisions about the, re uh, the use of resources. And as I said earlier on, there is so much potential information, knowledge and skills out there that could uh, inform these particular decisions that we cannot actually handle. So there will always be a need to draw boundaries around which information, knowledge and skills are appropriate for the evaluation to deliver an equitable outcome within the resources that are under our control. The final area of boundary choice is legitimacy. Now just follow this logic for a moment. If those equitable evaluation outcomes are to be achieved and sustained, then the evaluation's equitable outcomes have to have sufficient legitimacy and support. Now, in practice, the greatest threats to that legitimacy are from those who are likely to be negatively impacted by an equitable evaluation outcome. 
and especially those who have the agency and power to hinder or even prevent the outcome. How much an equity framed evaluation is prepared to trade off or negotiate with those stakeholders again is a critical boundary decision that needs to be very carefully deliberated on. So those are the four boundary choices. Now these boundary decisions raise issues about power and agency. Who has and who ought to have the power to decide these key boundaries? And one of the great advantages of a critical systems approach is that it forces these often hidden decisions into the open for discussion and deliberation. So let's explore what this might actually mean in practice. So we've developed a matrix of uh, interrelationships and perspectives and now we're going to have to try and work out how we're going to and what we're going to um, marginalize and what we're going to include. So let's say f that in terms of purpose that our primary beneficiaries of the evaluation are going to be disadvantaged students and that we are prepared to marginalize in our evaluation um, the interests of non-disadvantaged students. Now obviously there will be some debate around that but that's exactly the point of, of this uh, sort of table. Uh, in terms of resources we're going to say that the school principal has the final say when it comes to the use of resources and the rules around uh, that, that, that resource use. Within that, the evaluation steering group, which could be made up of, a, of, of various uh, stakeholders, um, has complete autonomy to decide whatever they wish to do within those resources available and within the rules that have been set. In terms of the knowledge, well, let's just say that we are going to include knowledge uh, acquired and information acquired from disadvantaged students and non-disadvantaged students. And also we're going to include experience of other equity outcome focused evaluations. On the other hand, we're just not going to take too much care of and possibly even ignore narratives and experiences outside the school community, this particular school community, or indeed the experiences outside the education field, for instance. Um, and also in terms of the technical side of the evaluation, we're not interested at all in any kind of results or information from non-participatory evaluation approaches. Now when it comes to legitimacy, we're actually prepared to negotiate who is and is not involved in some way in the evaluation process. But one thing that we're not prepared to negotiate in order to, in, in, in relation to ensuring a degree of legitimacy and sustainability, is that we're not going to, set, to exclude the, student, the disadvantaged student voice in evaluation decisions. So there we have it. There's um, one example of the way in which you can kind of generate debate around boundary decisions using a critical systems framing. So there we have it, a way of understanding how to design and management and evaluation focused on generating equitable outcomes using those aspects of a systemic approach that considers understanding interrelationships, engaging with multiple perspectives and reflecting on key boundary decisions. Quite a bit to take in. I'm going to pause again and invite some comments and reflections. So, comments and reflections. <clears throat> um, well, I might sort of kick in maybe with a more, more of a ponder than a question, but um, is, is it fair to say that, you know, like, you know, if we have equity for one stakeholder or group that that sort of, I mean, is it sort of binary in that 
you know, then it might not be equitable for another stakeholder group. And, you know, how do we resolve this tension or at least uh, acknowledge or manage in our practice? Have you ever had any sort of experiences in, with that situation? I think this is where we go back to the question of agency power uh, control um, and the nature of the evaluation economy. I have a particular interest in the nature of the, of the evaluation economy because the way in which evaluation has evolved in most countries is that um, we actually essentially ignore those challenges, right? We leave it to somebody else to make that decision. And I think one of the things that um, is a, 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 a substantial challenge uh, to the way in which evaluation is practiced um, is the, the development of the range of systems ideas that I'm, I'm promoting because it puts these kinds of decisions out in the open, right? And it actually loads a substantial responsibility for generating the discussion around those decisions uh, to the evaluator rather than hidden in the whiteboards of the evaluation commission. Um, do I have any particular answers? No. The, the idea in, in all of this is um, twofold. One of them, I believe, is to shift the, um, the role and responsibility, uh, you could argue the professionalism of evaluation, away from being, a, 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 essentially away from being a trade, doing people's bidding towards a craft and a profession by actually taking part in raising and taking part in the kinds of discourses uh, that, that we're talking about. Because it's all very well to say, how do we do it? But at the moment, we don't actually do it mm. in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Catherine? Yeah, thanks, Bob. This is great. Um, I just have a question around um, framing recommendations using this sort of approach. And I'm wondering if, um, like given if you um, identify the different way of framing of a particular issue, and you notice that they're quite, quite different, but then you're providing recommendations to a donor, but you want to use an equitable approach to that, could you then frame the recommendations from different perspectives as well? So if, if primarily the motivations of the donor were um, taken into account, you might uh, recommend this if you're, um, you know, taking the, the, um, the, I don't know, the primary like village people who are going to be benefiting from a particular activity. Would you then recommend this? Where you can't necessarily merge those recommendations into one nice, neat recommendation, could you frame the recommendations in in that way with some from multiple different perspectives? Or what have you seen done, or what have you done yourself? Thanks. Um, this is one of the reasons why I refuse to, um, uh, to deliver recommendations in my evaluation. Um, I actually believe, for a whole variety of reasons, that it was one of the greatest mistakes that evaluation has ever made, is to play amateur consultants. We're not paid to be consultants, we don't have the sufficient knowledge in the areas that we work in, or in the specifics of where we're working in. We're usually just in for a few days or a few weeks. Uh, when actually proper consultants will spend an entire year trying to work things through. So in a sense, you're asking the wrong person because I literally refuse these days. I will help the discussion around options and allow the, the key stakeholders, and this is, I think, where it gets closer to, to, um, uh, to our addressing your question, to develop recommendations themselves. So in a sense, what I would, I would, kind of fudge my answer to you by saying that in a sense, our job is to facilitate that discussion amongst um, the key power brokers and the key stakeholders um, that have a substantial interest in the outcomes of the evaluation. 
And that goes back again to the whole issue of power and agency is, you know, who, who determines ultimately who has the ability and authority to develop the recommendations uh, that, that, that come off from, a, um, uh, from any particular evaluation, if you are concerned about evaluation consequences. Um, there isn't a simple answer to that. Uh, we can't change the entire power structure of, um, of society through a single evaluation. But I do believe it is the evaluator's responsibility increasingly, if we wish to be a craft or a profession, to raise these issues and comment on um, the, the power relations that we actually see as recommend as ideas for the future begin to develop. Can I add to the discussion here, Bob? Um, on this idea of, of, of workshopping um, actions or recommendations with the, the different stakeholder groups involved, it strikes me that uh, we put a lot of thought into when we do focus groups or surveys, how we sample or how we include people in the, in the data collection process, but perhaps not as much thought into then how we interpret and make recommendations. Um, and I know in my practice, you know, data parties and the whole idea of bringing people together around a summit or something is something we're well versed at. But I, w I wonder if you've ever applied that approach, uh, a, more, a more nuanced, I guess, uh, approach to, to doing the analysis and sense making and action planning. Uh, within an evaluation setting very rarely because of the nature of the evaluation market, right? Um, I mean, I have fought literally fought uh, 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 evaluation commissioners, people who essentially pay my wages uh, to develop those sorts of ideas. And they just trundle along their 365 page evaluation guidelines report and saying, this is how you do it. Um, there's, so no, I, within an evaluation context, no, I haven't, but I don't always work within evaluation context. Um, and on those particular occasions, yes, I have actually managed to, to kind of pull those things through. Um, but there's no, you know, there is no, there's no magic method about this. I mean, I think one of the weaknesses of all of these sort of slightly more edgy um, uh, methods, and I want, I want, you know, my brief summing up to, to raise these things, is there is an issue of safety, right? And I think as we move closer to the boundaries, you know, as, as our evaluation approaches and methods move more, much more towards the boundaries of what is, what is generally accepted of our craft and of our uh, profession, then I think we do actually, um, we do have to keep a very close eye on on safety. I mean, I was I was doing some work in Rwanda uh, a couple of years ago, systems work. Uh, we were teaching actually um, uh, that we were trying to sort out a particular issue about kids hating school. Uh, now in Rwanda, you get killed if you go against all the gami. It's as simple as that. People follow you anywhere in the world and kill you, right? So in doing this sort of influence mapping thing, we had to literally design the process so that it maximize, that, that allowed us to have a systemic approach, um, but maxim, um, ensured that the various participants were organized and the job was framed in such a way that no one was put at risk. Because I think that's a really, really important area as we move closer to, to the boundaries of, of what is generally expected um, of this thing called evaluation. Does that help? Just noting we're getting very close to time. So I think maybe we've got time for one more question if anybody's got a burning question. Uh, just looking, actually, Emily, you just pop something up. Uh, um, so Emily's asking Bob uh, if, if you haven't read of it. Yeah, I'm trying. I've, I've probably read it too fast. Um, 
case, what evidence or data can we collect to address those evaluation questions and criteria in this need? Um, I think one of the things that, that I've always learned, or one of the things that you learn from thinking about things systemically is you can't collect everything. And you have to make quite important decisions about what data you do and you don't collect. Now, what I've provided within an equity frame um, are the kinds of areas that might actually get you closer to this. But in a sort of a day-to-day -day level, say for instance, when I'm designing a survey, um, I literally just say, this is the question I need to address. This is the data that I uh, need to be able, to, and this is, this is the data I'm intending to collect. And how am I going to actually physically use that data in the particular context that, I, that I've done? And I find those sorts of questions being quite specific. I set up yet another matrix, right? Um, and that I think helps me work out ultimately that in the end, within the resources I've got available, with the people I want to benefit and the kind of knowledge that is acceptable within this particular context, um, which actually are the data areas. But I, I'm, I'm kind of sense that I'm dodging the question a little bit. Maybe we can talk about it offline, but you know. You want my little wrap up? I think that might be might be good. Um, thank oh, you yeah. so much, Bob, for your time today and for your thought provoking presentation. And I think it sort of speaks to everybody's interest that um, most people have hung on, uh, you know, with meetings either side of this lunchtime session. So thank you once again. That's okay. This will take about two minutes and then we can all say our goodbyes. Yeah. The thing I'm often asked at the end of these sorts of presentations is, well, what do we do next? Where do we start on this kind of stuff? And my advice is this. Firstly, be strategic. Start with an aspect of the system field that interests you. If you're interested in interrelationships, if you're interested in diagramming, if you're interested in some kind of perspectival stuff, or if you're interested in the boundary stuff, start with that and play around with it first. Be careful. Using systems ideas can actually change your relationship with key colleagues and stakeholders. Just be aware of that. Be safe. For that reason, seek low risk and medium reward first. And be useful. Don't just run off and use systems ideas in any way. Just use them when you think they would add something valuable to your particular elevation. Uh, be creative. I've given you a bunch of ideas, but don't be purist. Adapt, invent. But just kind of stick to the, make sure you stick to the core principles. And above all, just have a bit of fun, because that's what it can be. And if you want to find out more information, here's some of the work that um, I've produced in this particular area. But honestly, there's just a mass of stuff out there. Um, and I'm more than happy to help guide people through what's available. Thanks uh, very much for your and time. And thanks, uh, Bob. And we just had a question from someone regarding sharing the presentation. Are you uh, happy to share your presentation slides? Absolutely right. Yeah, I, and um, it's uh, the whole thing. I mean, the, um, the the slides will come with the um, with the with the narrative as well. So. Um, more than happy around that yeah uh, and as and as always you know there's the after sales service i mean some of these ideas may interest you and obviously underneath each of the things in this you know very short presentation there's quite a lot of um, ideas and thoughts and experiences and networks that, that that can help you if you as in one of the um you know, one of the slide one of the final slides uh, we're saying, you know, kind of start start with something that kind of went, oh, you know, uh, don't feel you have to do the whole thing, you know, draw some boundaries around it, around it and, and, and work from there. I regard this whole thing as kind of a stepping stone approach, you know, you make the first step, you look around, see how useful it was, and what, what maybe the next step, and, and so on and so forth. So, so thanks yep. for your time, guys, and, and have fun playing around with some of these ideas. Don't hesitate to contact me if you have any particular questions. Uh,
every question I learned something from. So thanks. Thank you. And thank you everyone for staying and being a great audience.